is better than the Jabra system for doing that. It's better than the Jabra. Yeah, because I can sit there and I can talk. I don't sound like I've got my fingers in my ears. Um, I can hear my voice. I can hear things around me. So. It's better than the Jabra. Uh-oh. 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 Okay, so it's better than that. Yes. Okay, I think that's good. All right. It's almost time. I know, I know. But the, um, they're not bad. They're good. I like them. You know, all in all. But um, I still think the microphones might pick up too much ambient noise. On the, the, the Jabras. On the Jabras. They have a, um, I think a four microphone setup that tries to triangulate, isolate sound, so it keeps it inside your bubble. But if you have wind noise or other things passing by you, it's passing by inside your bubble, so it's picking it all up. Like if I'm sitting outside and I'm on a voice call, they, everybody can hear the birds around you, and it sounds like it's right there next to you, even though it's. 12 feet away. So. Huh. I, I have a feeling I would be talking with my hands a lot. That's all right. That's normal. That's normal. <laughs> Completely normal. <laughs> and you know, Dumbartons have a really short ash. Do they? Typically, a lot of the ones that I've smoked, I drop more ash with Dumbarton than I do anything else. <laughs> I think okay. I think we're, I think we're there. I think it's time. Gotta make sure if I do that. Is that right? Let me close all these windows here. Out. What do you mean? Pull? Yeah, yeah, you're here. I gotta position my stand. It needs to be <laughs> to lean this way and not lean the other way. All right. Hey everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight for coffee and cigars, where we will explore just that: coffee, cigars, and anything else that may come to mind. It's a live stream cast, so please be sure to drop your comments in the, well, I don't know where they are, wherever they are on your screen, because depending on how you resize your, your YouTube, it could be anywhere. All right, so tonight we've got Al Plitt here joining us tonight in the studio. How you doing? And Al is a longtime cigar and pipe guy. And um, yeah, so we'll get into that in a bit. We just, um, we've got some coffee today. Our coffee is this one, the... San Isidro from Cafe Shake Shell. My friend Katya Duke is the producer of the coffee out in uh, Santa, Ro Santa Rosa de Copan in Western Honduras. And it's um, grown at 1500 meters, shade grown Katuai. And it is just a beautiful coffee that's natural processed. So it's got a lot of berry tones and fruit flavors. And we're gonna brew that today in the Chemex or Chemex, as my friends in Latin America like to call it, or at least in Mexico. So we got the Chemex and the Chemex filter. This is the FC100. And we're gonna take that and we're gonna start off by wetting it down. I'm gonna hold it up and probably burn myself. So you wanna wet down the, the paper filter. We wanna get into the coffee right away because we want to get into it all right away, so... You got a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. So, what do you use at home? I use a Chemex. Oh, uh, then you know this one right on. Oh, yeah. There's a reason why we brought Al, and this is why. <laughs> <laughs> so, the paper... The one thing with the paper filter, the Chemex, right? It's actually a pine-based filter that um, that is unique to the Chemex. So, a lot of people talk about... Um, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, we want to put like a metal filter. Yeah. Well, the whole thing, I'm like, yeah, sure, the, the, the shape is like iconic and it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it was developed in 1941 by that guy Schlombaum, but the thing about this, it's just a pretty piece of glass. The whole thing about the Chemex is the paper filter. So if you get rid of the paper filter, well, you've lost everything about the Chemex and now you've just got a metal, metal filter that... that I never liked anything. the metal filter. I don't always, understand. Always went paper. Charlatans. We call them charlatans. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got our coffee. It's in here. 
We're gonna grind it in our virtuoso Baratza grinder. So the Virtuoso is a conical burr grinder. Really great, it's about 200, what, 250 bucks, I think? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. It's on, it's on spurrowcoffee.com and you can get that there. We'll send it to you right away. And um, yeah, that's what, kind of what it is. Yeah, I actually use the Encore. Do right? you use Encore at home? Yeah, at home, yeah. That's a great one. That's a really great, like, entry level, good quality, mm -hmm. nice burr stuff, burr quality, yeah. grind quality. Yeah. I don't know how noisy it is. Is it noisy? It's almost done. Is it almost done? All right, excellent. So we've got our coffee here. I'm going to put it in. Make it level. The thing that I worry about every week sitting here and like brewing the coffee is that I'm gonna pour the coffee, the water on my legs. All right, so here's the coffee. We're gonna put about 200 grams or 200 milliliters of water first to saturate the grind. We're gonna, can you see it? I don't know if you can see it. Huh? All right, that's going to get our first saturation. What typically will happen is that um, with the when you're doing like a two cup Chemex, which is um, we're using 48 grams of coffee to make 24 ounces of uh, liquid, which is a double a double serving for us at Spro. And um, we just put the 200 grams for like the first 30 seconds to get the the whole thing started, get it uh, nice and uh, wet and everything. But then we just kind of hit it harder with the water until we get to the full volume. Oh, I'm just going to go straight to the thing here. I wonder if we're going to be out of water. We had a sur surprise visitor right before we started here at the, uh, at the roastery. And I had to brew some coffee for our friend's mom. All right, here we are. internet is running slowly. How do you brew at home, Al? So, I have the Chemex with the, the wood sides. So oh, that's the fancy one. Well, yeah, I don't have the glass handle, the safety handle. Is it? Um, Actually, the only reason we have this because I, I don't like to, I don't want to have to take it apart to wash it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just try not to spill coffee on the outside of it. That's smart. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> well, when you make only one a day, I guess that's easy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I'll, you know, portion my coffee out. I will. I'll actually, when I'm leveling it, I'll give it a couple taps to try to get some of the separation of the fines mm -hmm. and the, you know, more stuff that might be low coarser to kind of separate and settle a little bit better. Um, my favorite thing about it is after the bloom, when you hit it with that, that first real pour and you see the coffee just come to life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and, all in. Yeah, and you see that little bit of almost like, almost like creme on the top and it just, it, it looks great. And when you're doing it in the morning, you know, 15 minutes after you first woke up and you don't know quite what you're doing, it makes for interesting oh, coffee yeah. sometimes. That's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> All right, I think we're done. So we've got our Chemex, nicely brewed, professionally brewed. We've got a cup. I should pour it this way. Mm -hmm. Cup for you, Al. Oh, thank you, sir. You're very welcome. And a 
Another one, excellent. All right. Bon appetit, or what, I don't know. Prost, I don't know what people Prost, bon appetit, oh, I don't know. Oh, still hot, still hot. There's two people watching. Hello. So if you have anything to say, drop it in the comments. We'd like to hear from you. Otherwise, we're just talking into the void somewhere out there. So what do you, any, any, are you tasting anything yet or is it still too hot? It's, it's pretty hot, um, but it's really good. You know, okay. with, one thing with the Chemex, you get a very clean taste because of that paper filter. Yes. You know, yes. You, you don't. It's not muddied like you would see in like a French press, or or something like that. It, you get a very clean. So the the nuance is is there, um, and you get spoiled very quickly drinking coffee like this, and then trying to go back and drinking other stuff. It's kind of like going from Bud Light to craft beer for the first time. You're like, <laughs> oh crap! Oh, you're like, oh gosh, <laughs> I can't do this. this. <laughs> There's no going back. <laughs> I can't drink this 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 lightly this lightly swill. It doesn't taste like rice and beer. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work. Well, actually, I like rice. Yeah, but that not that, oh, not okay. beer not in beer. Oh yeah yeah that makes it. Well yeah yeah that's true that's true that's true that's true. Um, all right good good. So if you want the coffee or the Chemex we're using a to, that we're using here tonight. Um, be sure to visit the website sparrowcoffee.com and uh, remember you get 10% off by using the uh, the coffee live um, discount code so put coffee live in your discount code when you check out you get 10% off and also if you want the, uh, there's actually coffee subscriptions that you can have that uh, that you get 10% off anyway so you can do a coffee sub coffee subscription of either one two three four five whatever many coffees you want and we'll send it to you in whatever interval you like. So weekly, bi-weekly, tri-weekly, month to month. We'll send it to you. And you even get 10% off on that. So that's at SpurCoffee.com. Or just for today, you can use um, Coffee Live to get 10% off whatever you want to buy on the on our web store. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Good. Sounds good. All right. So today's cigar is the Dumbarton Trust. I always say Dumbarton. I think that's a big, like... Faux pas in this cigar. I, I, I get made fun of for mispronouncing things all the time. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> but it's done with a D-U-N Barton Trust.com. I know I put that. There's one post somewhere that I kind of made the mistake with the M and I had to correct them all. And I couldn't recall all of the, uh, the postings. I was like, darn it. <laughs> um, but so the Dunbarton Trust, we got the Sober Mesa Brule Toro. Like they were saying that. Sober, there's no real ter translation they were saying for Sober Mesa. Yeah. Did you hear about that? No. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Something about it being sitting around the table, because Mesa is like table in Spanish. Sobre, sobre is kind of like, like so much, like you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it in English, but it's, yeah. it's like, it's kind of like a nucleotide. I don't know what that. Well, now what's that? Gemütlichkeit. 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 It's, uh, it's like happy drinking time in German, but there's no real English oh. translation. Well, yes, I guess, but sobre would be like you're drinking yeah. so much, like you're drinking a lot. Right. So I guess this is sober is like you're at the table a lot. I guess so because they're all fairly large formats. Right now, you have the Toro, which is. Uh, it's a fairly robust size. The mm -hmm. the grande, the uh, the double corona, even the robusto, it being only five inches, is still I think a fifty two ring gauge. Yes, yes, that's true. Five fifty two because both the Toro and the and the robusto are fifty two inches. They're just a difference in length. Yes, because right? yeah, so. their gordo is sixty. Right. Yeah. Right. But then you also have the the new size that was released earlier this year, which is the double corona. And the double Corona is is over six inches, 
and I think it's a 54, 56 ring, something of that nature. Okay. So it's it's bigger than both of these. Um, maybe not bigger than the, the Gordo, but I, I'm not a big ring gauge smoker. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. I'm not too much into that. So, I mean, is that coming along yet, or not? It's still is, too warm. It, it's changed. It's not. It's it's good to see. There's there is a lot of fruit to it. Okay. And any particular type of fruit? See, I would go with a little bit more of the darker, stone fruitish, maybe things. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, like a plum kind of stone like, fruit. Almost like plum. Even going into that almost, almost cherryish, but it has that little bit of. I get an initial like, light brightness of like a strawberry. That's what I get initially. Yeah, I can see. But that. I definitely see the plum that you're talking about, especially as it gets further down the palate. Mm -hmm. Which kind of makes me excited to try it with the with the cigar. Right. I, I was actually the first few sips. The only thing I was thinking of, how is this going to pair with the cigar? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, is it going to be um, contradicting flavors that help work to elevate at both? Or is it going to be more complementary flavors that help bring things up? And, I don't know, I guess we're, we're going to have to find out. All right, we're going to find out. So we've got the Dunbarton Trust. Can you, will this zoom in on it? There we go. So... The Dunbarton Trust is the, this is the Sobre Mesa Brule Toro. This is um, 6x52. It is, um, what is it, 6x52 Ecuador, Connecticut, shade grown G2BW wrapper around uh, Mexican, Mata, Mata, Mexican Matacapan San Andres Negro de Temporal binder. Oh, 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 we're getting out of, we're getting out of focus. And the filler is, um, Nicaraguan Condega S or Nicaraguan Condega CSG Pueblo Nuevo Criollo La Jolla Esteli C98 and ASP Esteli Hybrid Ligero and those are all made at the um, La Jolla de Nicaragua factory by Dr. Cuenca for Steve Saka right Steve Saka yeah. all right and so here's yours oh thank you sir thank you and um, it comes wrapped in cello with a label in the back and barcodes for the cigar people, uh, the cigar retailer. And it's got, what, a, a band on the foot? What do they call that? A foot band? Yeah. Yeah, a band on the foot. Is that going to focus? Focus? No. No focusing. All right. We'll take that off. You know, I was reading something that they say you're not supposed to do this at the cigar shop. No, especially now. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you be that one creepy guy in there, like yeah, shoving like, the cigar up your nose. It's not like, good. <laughs> <laughs> See, what would you do if you walk in a cigar shop and there's somebody doing that? Unfortunately, I would judge them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's. It's funny the things you see in cigar shops. The like what else? Oh here. Cut. Well, did you see the? Did, oh, thank you. Did you hear what happened in Pennsylvania? No. There was a guy that shot at one of the employees. At a cigar shop. Because he was told to wear a mask when he came in, and he he lost his cool. At a cigar shop? Yes. Holy smokes. Did did he kill the guy? No. No. I hope he got banned. <laughs> Some places it might not. You, you never know at these places. Like, oh, it's all right. He'll be fine next week. So we're using the cigar uh, Zycar MTC. I need to get more light. Sweet. Yes. Instantly. 
Now, do you normally do a cold draw? If you've never had this cigar before, would you do a cold draw? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. I, I would more often than not. No? Oh, no, I would. Oh, you would? Because it's going to change. As soon as you put heat to it, it changes. So I want to see what that change is going to be. You know? But, you know, they, always, they, they talk about this brulee having a sweet tip. Right, yeah, and there's definitely sweet, but you know it's not, it's not as sweet as you would. When people talk about it, it's not it's not as sweet as you would think that they're talking about it. Right. Be, well, everybody asks that question: Is this a sweetened cigar? Right. But really, it's not necessarily the right question. The right question would be: Can a natural cigar leaf be this sweet naturally? Okay, so it could be, but w right. here's the question then. So, like I've heard, I've heard people say this, it's a sweet tip and all this, and I, I know that Sokka's always like, no, it's not, and, and he even has that one cigar line coming out, right? Yeah, yeah, the, it's a three-pack that's okay. not labeled. It has one natural, just like this one. It's supposed to have one that's sweetened. I think one that's double or triple sweetened, and he's not telling you which one is which, but he is labeling them so you know one is one, one is the other, one is the next. And it's kind of done in that manner just to kind of say, you know, leave me alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is a natural cigar. Well, he's called the STFU, right? I think so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, but here's the thing. So if, like, if I was to try, if I, if I'm, there's that one Drew Estate one that's really sweet. Yeah, but is that but, the Deadwood series? I don't know. I, I picked it up a, at this. I I, I wasn't yeah. I wasn't paying attention when I bought it. I just bought it, and I was like, "Oh, that's a, that's a new looking cigar for me." And I was, mm -hmm. "I'll give it a try." So I bought one, and I took it with me, and I smoked it. I was like, "Holy crap! What is this? It's so sweet." But like, on the ones that I've tried like that, they're really sweet. Like this is a light sweetness. Yeah. And okay, so here's the thing. So it's a light sweetness that, as I've been tasting it. That sweetness that was really apparent at the very first time has toned down, kind of like as you're like you're chewing gum and you kind of get used right. to the chewing but gum. But it's still there. It's still there. It's still there. But here's the thing. So it, to back to which goes back to your point. If if this is a cigar, a wrapper, if this Connecticut Shade G2BW wrapper is actually a naturally sweet, then wouldn't the rest of it be sweet? It would, but I I don't want to like it. Cigar. So, but if I was to lick it, see, it doesn't have the same sweetness. I did hear one person put it on to vegetable glue, and they said the vegetable glue used in the cap imparted a little bit of sweetness with this. Well, if that's the case, well, well let, let's get to lighting. We should light. Okay. We should light. Here's a, here, oh, you got a lighter. Yeah, I got a lighter. So we're lighting the cigar. I've got the Jetline G4000. It's my, uh, oh, it's not working. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> this is, oh. This is my Star Trek phaser of lighters. That's a lot of heat. It it's, is. It's a Kerbal torch. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's in a, in a phaser kind of configuration. So I feel very Star Trek-y. But you also have to be careful because you can burn the crap out of it because it's double flame and how big are those jets? It might be a double but I mean But this thing burns through gas like you would not believe. It's ridiculous. That's not a complaint. That's a sign of like awesomeness. Now, do you blow through your cigar when you light it? Or do you just go in? I go in. Okay. If, if I'm having a problem with a cigar, occasionally I would. It's well, not the best thing. But I've heard people talk about how, like, when they light the cigar, yeah. they want to blow th out first to get any kind of negative out instead of sucking it in. I don't know. Have you heard that? Oh, I've never heard that. Oh, I've right. never, never, never done that. 
so. So if you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. Love to hear from you guys. I'm not sure how many the internet here is running a little bit slow, so I'm not sure where we are. So, mm -hmm. how do you think it's changed from that cold draw to now being lit? Hold on, let's see where that. Let me just drop this on the end. How do I feel it's changed since it was since it was the cold drop? Yeah. What else is present that wasn't present during? Or has it has it mellowed a little bit? Or is it has the sweetness changed? No, the sweetness is there. It, 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 I don't know what it is on, on mine, but on my path, there's a slight acridity. But I don't know if that's just from the lighting. How about for you? Did it change? I still have the sweetness still lingers a little bit longer than what it did with the cold draw. I can feel it in my mouth a little bit. Um, some of the other background flavors that were there during the cold draw have become a little bit more present, but they're they're round. <laughs> they're not. It's not a, a here I am kind of thing. How about the retro hail? Do you? You know, I'm not very. Good. I tried that last week, and I'm not. So you're supposed to. What are you supposed to? See, some. How are you supposed to do that? For me, I like to. All right, when we had our coffee, our coffee just came off, brew right around 200 degrees. It's going to be really hot. To really, you, you but you let that coffee mellow. So now that it's come down in temperature a little bit, the flavors have changed, some other things have become a little bit more prominent. So for me, when I pull the smoke into my mouth, I'll typically try to let the smoke mellow a little bit. And then I'll try to slowly retrohale. And if it starts to get too much, I'll open my mouth and kind of, kind of let it kind of pass through. This one doesn't have a bad retro. It's but not you're sharp, supposed to pass spicy. it through, bring it in and then yeah. pass it through. All right, mm -hmm. let me try that. I don't know if I'm doing it. No, you don't have to inhale. No. It's kind of like, yeah, you're just holding it in your mouth and then just breathing out through your nose. Jeez. See, I'm so trained to, like, not let it go down any mm -hmm. my esophagus at all that I, I have to, like, I would have to... You I get a little bit. I'm getting a little bit. If you, yeah, but open up, open up your mouth a little bit and kind of let it kind of flow, just like um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> easy, easy, easy. But I saw that Jerry <laughs> Falwell picture earlier today, so I'm just like that's when what's you, in my mind. It's kind of like okay, when you are tasting wine, tasting coffee. You oh, there we that, go. There we go. You have that. Yeah, you have that slurp, right? Uh -huh. And that slurp is to help activate some of that um that nasal, you know, old factory responses. So by the retrohale, sometimes it's way too much, and it's just way too overpowering for that. But having your mouth open just a little bit and just relaxing it through, you can start to pick up some of that slightness through your old factory. All right, let's try it, let's try it. Uh, I, I, I think I'm getting some of it, but 
So I can feel it in the in the back part of my nasal passage, but the retrohale is something that's eluded. It eludes me. Oh, we have a question. So Rusty Obra, down in New Jersey. Hey, Rusty, what's going on? How you doing? Is asking, what's the retail price on the cigar? He tried his local tobacconist, but they didn't have any. Yeah, I think MSRP for this is somewhere around thirteen fifty. Yeah, thirteen fifty. Okay. And then we paid. So I got this at my my buddy works at a. Our friend works at a cigar shop here called Mount Washington Cigars, mm -hmm. and locally, so these cigars, call, I bought these last week on the 29th, and so these were fourteen thirty nine dollars each, but that's because it's higher here because Maryland has an OP, OTP tax. Mm -hmm. that, how much does it add on? I think 15%. 15%? I think. Um, but, you know, Mount Washington was actually one of the only places that had this cigar. Yeah, yeah. It's actually... Um, not that that easy to find even if you find a shop that has um dunbarton you know product why is that do you think um from the different retailers i've talked to it's because of the sweetness what they think it's like a swisher sweet they, well they associate that sweetness yeah with something that's a little bit lower quality and you know connecticut's are a little bit different and i think Saka himself even said he brewed this, he made this Connecticut to be different than the other Connecticut's that were coming to market in our current, you know, day and age. Uh -huh. You know, it's, um, a lot of them are not that, that traditional Connecticut. And then now if you go, try to go traditional Connecticut, it's very hay-like, straw-like, super mild, doesn't taste like anything, or it's just not the same. So he wanted to make something different. He did make something different, but then the question becomes, is it sweet? And does it follow that same stigma of other sweetened cigars? Well, you know, I, I had smoked this a couple times before. Like when, they, when I first heard about it, there was a retailer up in um, Delaware that had it. So I drove to Delaware like an hour away to buy some and try it. And the, I thought it was, I remember it being sweeter. Yeah. In the past. I, I mean, now it's very, it's not as sweet as I recall. And I don't know if that's just because I'm tarnishing my memory in it. I heard it. so much about this cigar being sweetened. And it's when Saka announced that three pack that <laughs> I finally said, I got, I got to make up my own opinion. So this is your first time trying it? No, I, I've oh, had okay. this cigar before, but it was hard to find. So it took me a while before I actually found it and I can actually make up my own mind. Um, Where did you get it the first time? B&B &B Cigars in Philadelphia. I was oh, yeah, traveling yeah, yeah. for work, wasn't too far. That cigar shop was on my bucket list, and it's a cool little shop. Um, mm. Even during... Is that the one that's in downtown Philly? It's not in downtown Philly, oh. it's, but it's in on a main, historic Main Street. Um, it's a small shop, but they had a nice little outside area where I was able to sit after driving for two hours and and have a cigar before I got to my hotel. Hmm. So. I mean, this one, it's, it's light. I, I, I would say it's light. It's not, it's not the heavy cigars that we're used to in modern times. No, but it has flavor. Yes, yes, agreed, agreed. It's not a mild with no flavor. But it's much more nuanced flavor. Yes. It's not like some of these other cigars that are like hitting you in the mm -hmm. face, you know, with their flavors. I... It would definitely be a first cigar of the day. A second cigar of the day, you are going to lose a lot of that, and all you're going to taste is the sweet. So if you're talking about a guy that went to the IPCPR or the uh, PCA show last year, and they tried the cigar when it first came out, they're smoking five, six you know, cigars beforehand. Oh, gosh, yeah. How the hell are they going to taste that? Yeah, I you know? can see that. Definitely, definitely. So their mindset, though, they're going to taste the sweet, and they're going to associate it with sweet. Yeah. But uh, if you've smoked five or six cigars at, like, say, the PCA, ICP, IPCPR, and you had this one, I mean, would you even remember? Could you even really remember it? You it's would so because much it's different. You'd remember because of the, that light it's sweet. It's because it's not. I wouldn't say it's that, that sweet. No, it's not. Cotton it's candy a very sweet. mild sweet. It's not even like, 
sweet, like what are the other sweet cigars that are out there? There's um, that Drew one. There's the, yeah, Deadwood What's series. What's the one I can think of? They're, I mean, they're one of the most predominant. Um, but then that's, it's hard because then you start going way outside this price point and you start going to things like Baccarat. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Or, you know, if you went down to Tampa and you went to all those sh the shops, they normally have their normal productions, they'll, they'll do a sweetened version of. And so you have, there it's great because you can taste the sweetened and the unsweetened and you really understand what a sweet cigar tastes like. So it's just, so between this and the other Silver Mesas, it's just a wrapper? I don't, I don't know. That's a very good question, actually. That is a good question. We should have, should have looked that up earlier. Research. <laughs> but so back to what you're saying, Rusty, the, um, this cigar we got from Mount Washington Cigar, mm -hmm. and I'm sure if you called Tony, he would send some, if he still has me, he'd send them up to you that, mm -hmm. in Jersey, that'd be no problem. So that's Mount Washington Cigar in Baltimore. On Falls Road, ask for Tony. Yeah. Yeah. How's the coffee doing? Coffee's doing well. It's coffee's oh, tempered much down. faster than I am. Well, now it's tempered, so I, I can take a, I'll, I'll take a little bit more. And there's a nice pleasant, like, fruitiness to it. Yeah. There. It's like, like berries on top of a creme brulee. <laughs> just gotta get your torch. <laughs> it actually goes well. It's going it well with this, I think. Like, there's a little bit of nuttiness, I think, a light, like mm -hmm. peanut kind of character to it that, that I think almost like a peanut butter jelly kind of combination. You think peanut butter? I think. Well, not peanut butter, but like, but, like maybe a nuttiness, like a peanutty nuttiness, or maybe like almond style nuttiness. I, I would almost. You think hazelnut? No. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the ash is very nice. It's pretty white. I mean, can you? Can, the construction is light here. spectacular. So, oh, that's not working. There we go. That's better. So yeah, the construction is really nice. I mean, but it's made by Hoya de Nicaragua, which is actually a really mm -hmm. they do a really nice job. What I should do is I like, compile B-roll footage so I can like run B-roll while we're talking about it <laughs> of like the factories, you know? But see, you are also going a lot faster than I am. But yeah, I do smoke, I do tend to smoke fast. So, but with that, with that, you have also a little bit more heat. So you might be tasting some more things that, or some other things that I'm not tasting mm. and vice versa. Maybe that's why it's more peanut rather than Mm -hmm. So maybe I should slow down. I'll try to slow down. You know, oh, yeah, so Rusty just said, did you hear the news about Nat Sherman closing? Yes, yeah, I did yeah. hear about Shocking. that. Shocking. They're going to close it, what, next week? Uh, I think this is, yeah, this is the last month. Have you been there? I never got a chance to go. Oh, man, it, their townhouse was super cool. It's, like, right on, like, 42nd Street. Yeah, 42nd Street, right by... Um, Right by uh, uh, Central, darn it. What's the name? Grand Central Station. Okay. I, uh, and it's gorgeous inside. Like, you can go sit, you can sit, like, on the balcony. There's a balcony area you can sit mm -hmm. on. And then there's a lounge downstairs, but that's a member's lounge, and you can't really go there. I've seen videos. I'm not allowed to go there. They took me on a tour, they took, but they, they, they no. wouldn't let me sit in there. Oh. They, they, they politely escorted me out. They're like, oh, you should, you should probably leave now. I think I saw a video... That they had this humidor down in the basement that was in the private area that was pre-embargo. Mm. I mean, they had, I know they had to have some stuff in there that was just epic. But um, all in all, I understand it. It's sad um, because it's an iconic name. It really yeah, is yeah. iconic. I think what they what, did they did you read why they're getting out? Did anyone read why they're getting out? Because I haven't heard. From what the speculation that I heard was the company that that bought them. Okay. Initially bought them not for their cigars in that line, but for the cigarette. Hmm. And it was done as to provide competition for brands like American Spirits that had that natural. Had a name brand already associated with it. 
for being a natural cigar and more or cigarette and something a little bit more so it was a cigarette and uh, i don't think it would panned out exactly the way they wanted to they put it on the market for a year and had some mixed you know um responses but weren't weren't able to close the deal so um they decided to uh make that decision for me mm. well they did make good cigarettes i guess they make good cigarettes I, I used to get the, um, they make, or I don't know if they still make it, because I don't follow that kind of thing, but they would make these um, colored, mm -hmm. colored cigarettes. <laughs> so, my, this girl I was dating in high school, she loved those. <laughs> I never smoked cigarettes. No, me neither. So yeah, I, I think that's disgusting. Disgusting. I, I couldn't, couldn't tell you. But. But you're a big pipe guy. I am, yeah. Yeah. Um. You know, it's funny, smoking a pipe actually taught me how to smoke a cigar better. Well, tell me, tell me. Um, if you smoke a pipe wrong, yes, it corrects you. You get tongue bite, the bowl gets too hot, you'll burn out the pipe, you're not going to have yeah, that Yeah, that's why I don't enjoy experience. it, because you get that, that tongue bite that's so, like, it's like, ah, oh, I can't. But you also have a, if you pack the bowl right, you get a very clear draw. And if you get a pipe that's more artisan made, um, then you might have a pipe that has an open airway that's that smoke just rolls through. So you think about a poorly rolled cigar that has a really open airway, you don't get that much smoke production. You, it's a struggle to keep lit. It's just not enjoyable. But if you put the smoke production in there, with a really open airway, that's more like a pipe. and It's how to take those small little sips from the pipe that translate over into the cigar. So you can see where my cigar is and where your cigar is. Oh yeah, we're going, I'm going pretty fast. So it's the little sips. Now, drinking Instead coffee, of me, I'm gulping. I'm gulping. <laughs> yeah, but drinking coffee is completely different because I'm gulping the coffee and you're taking a little yeah, sip of coffee. I'm, I'm only to about here. I'm only to about here. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm down here. <laughs> so we're kind of opposite in that respect. So, Rusty, if you're home and anybody else, what are you guys smoking tonight? If you're smoking at all. I, I think Rusty's probably not smoking because last week he had to go to back to, he had to work on Fridays. So ah. last week he wasn't smoking because of that. Now, what, I know we're smoking this cigar now, but what do you normally like to smoke? Oh, man. For me? Just top three brands. Roma Craft, and to be, well, Roma Craft Intemperance BA 21 Revenge. Man, I was just looking for brands. <laughs> but yeah. that's, that's, for the last, like, two, three years, like, I've got stacks of boxes, empty boxes. Mm -hmm. Like, it's ridiculous. It's a solid it, It's cigar. probably almost to my... It's probably... If I stack them up, it's probably almost to my height. It's a solid cigar. Yeah, I can't get enough. I can't get enough. Now, I'll smoke that over everything else. Right when now. you were developing the Esteli brand, is that the cigar that you use? No, no, no. Okay. Esteli was more for general cigar smoking. Okay. I mean, yeah, general cigars, you know, cigars in general, not general, but cigars in general, um... Yeah, it was because we did the, the Fratello right. starting in 2013, and so that was really developed to pair directly with the Fratello Red. Right. But the Esteli, we wanted to do a, a little bit wider so that you, it, would, it would make sense with a wider variety of cigars. But, and, that, and that's the thing, like one of the things about that would be, I think would be problematic with pairing to something like what I liked so solely mm -hmm. in terms of the Revenge, is that the Revenge and is a very particular cigar. It's very, it's got a, a good amount of strength. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a good amount of intensity and flavor, you know, spiciness. And that's not necessarily what a lot of people would like, I don't think. I mean, yeah. I think within a certain cognoscenti, there is a very big enthusiasm for Roma Craft cigars. Yeah. But if, if we're looking at the larger market, it's, I think it would be, if we, if we, if we cultivated a, a coffee just for, what I liked, it would be 
maybe too narrow. I see. I see. It's because <coughs> this, when previously, early this year, you did a live event with Raul from the Tobacco Leaf. Right. Where we fe you feature the Esteli brand, and he put together a pack. And in that pack was a Robusto oh, yes, of yes. the Intemperance uh, BA. And when you guys did video, I was like, eh, no, we don't drink that much coffee in the evening, but I got to. So I brewed up some of the Esteli, went outside, had, you know, I saved that one cigar. The Roma. The Roma. Okay. Specifically for that. Plus, pulled it out of the cellophane. Cellophane was that beautiful amber color. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he had some really old cigars in that in that pack. And it, it was, a great was pack. it was an aha moment. Oh. It was a... Uh, you know, stars align and everything's happy in the world kind of thing. Ooh, this ash is actually holding on pretty tight. I'm not going to drop it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's well constructed. This one. Mm -hmm. No, I mean it. It could be something that that's more subconscious, but I tried not to like cultivate it to what I would. Right. Solely to what I like, because I think that you know, I I tend to be a little bit more of a narrower focused cigar mm -hmm. smoker. You know. So I don't want it to be. That, I'm just concerned about that, you know, especially on a, on a on a product that we're bringing for a lot of people to try. Right. Yeah. You want. Yeah. I under, fully understand that. Yeah. But it did pair really well, well with it. Uh, <laughs> success. Excellent. <laughs> and I'm still smoking this fast. I'm still going too fast. Okay. Too wait a minute. You just ashed, right? Yes. Do you ever look at your ash? and read what the ash is telling you. You know what I'm talking about? No, no. I mean, I, I look at it. Does it look whole? No, 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 I'm looking at the cigar. So you're, there's a little bit, it's it's a little bit present, but not really present. Okay, So let's look at this. All right, so let's see if it'll focus in. I just gotta get the right distance. But hold it vertical, hold it completely vertical. There, that's the look that we're looking. See how it has that kind of cone shape? Right. The tobaccos that take the longest to burn are going to be those Lajero tobaccos, right? And there, a lot of the Lajeros are going to be inside that filler. So when you're getting that cone shape, it's because the tobaccos in the center, they haven't had the time to burn all the way through. Because it's going too fast. Because you're going too fast. Going too so fast. when you get that so first ash... I'll no, put it down for a while. Yeah, well, yeah, you can do that. Or you can just... Uh, Take uh, smaller bites, huh? <laughs> so, okay. I still have a little bit of it on mine. Oh, yeah, that's much better. You can see it. Yeah, you don't, you don't have the, the Kona, the Kona. No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, we'll slow down. So you've, we'll never, slow. you've never read the ash like no, that? No, I never thought about I've never thought about it in that way. Like, no. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, it's... This reminds me of like the time when I, I, I smoked with Skip Barton the first time. Yeah? Because he's sitting there, we're sitting there, a whole bunch of friends of mine, and we're sitting around, and Skip's with us, and he's like, whatever cigar we were smoking, he's taking it apart and talking about this is this filler, this is this leaf, and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, what? What are you talking about? What is all that about? No idea. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating. Like, I never had thought about that this conical shape means that we're going too fast and that the Lejero is burning slower. And I can't... I mean, of course, I can't, I can't prove it. I'm just a... No, 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 It makes sense. If you look at your cigar... Right. ...and your ash, I mean, we're, there's, there is a noticeable difference between yours and mine. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But that... Uh, I'll try to read that that first ash drop is a, is a really good indicator huh. to saying what am I doing and it's just reading that and that's also like with the pipe you have to be able to read when it's telling you to tamp you know so that you maintain that that flame that so what is it, does it actually what does it tell you when does it tell you so when you're smoking it and your smoke production starts to go down a little bit or the flavors start to change a little bit, then sometimes that's because you need to go ahead and just give it a little bit of love and give it a little bit of a tamp and bring it back. 
you know, the when people try a pipe for the first time, they really they say it's too much work. They say it's I, it keeps on going out. You know, I, I got a tab and everything else, but that's only because you you don't know how to listen to it yet. You don't know how to speak the language. Okay. So by doing it more, you start to learn the language. You know, um, you start to realize when what it's saying to you, when it's time to tamp, you know, when it's what it's actually doing. Um, you also learn how you're packing. You know, am I packing too tight? Am I packing too loose? Is the tobacco too wet? A lot of that tongue bite, tongue burn is normally from steam production because when somebody first starts with a pipe tobacco, instantly they think aromatic pipe tobacco, which for me, is the wrong way to go. Too wet of a, of no, a tobacco? No, it's uh, artificial sweetness. Mm. You know, and the that artificial sweetness, especially in pipe tobacco, it comes through as an extremely mild, almost flavorless. Um, there are some good aromatics that have good flavor to them. They use quality leaf, but a lot of times you don't get that. And I guess that's also something with this, to say that it's artificially sweetened, I still get a lot of nuance. And I still get a lot of other flavors. It's just not sweetness. So going back to that question, is it possible that it could be a natural sweetness from the leaf? To be honest with you, I say absolutely. Hmm. I think absolutely it could be a natural sweetness. Um, but I don't know. I guess we'll have to... See if we can hunt down one of those packs when they come out <laughs> with the uh, the natural, the sweetened, and the double or triple sweetened, whatever he uh, decided to do to shut everybody up. <laughs> Wait, so it's it's this cigar or his production cigar, uh -huh. and then two other one, two others that are two more other sweet? exactly the same cigar, but sweeter, and then stupid sweet. Because they've been, they've added sweetness to because it. Because he's added sweetness to it. And it was done, and I think they're labeled like 1, 2, and 3, or A, B, and C, and he doesn't correlate what cigars are which. Okay. So pretty much so that you can make up your own decision, and you can actually see what it tastes like. And so, I mean, it'd be interesting to see when he actually tells you what cigar A is, what cigar B is, and which one, if people are, are able to, to really pull out. I, I'm ex expecting that there's going to be a big difference between these cigars. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, otherwise, why would you do it? I know. Yeah. So when's that supposed to come out? You know, with everything happening, hey, right now, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I don't know. He had, this cigar had two other sizes to be released this year. Mm -hmm. The one we talked about was the um, Corona Gorda, which is uh, really big. It's over six inches, 54 ring gauge. Does not spark anything with Corona in my mind, even Corona Gorda. But the other one is a really nice, beautiful shape. It's the uh, Brulee Blue, I believe. And that one's going to be a little bit over six inches, maybe like six and a quarter. And it's going to be... 46 ring gauge. So it'll be the smallest ring gauge for this cigar. And he said he tweaked the blend a little bit. Okay. But he also said that those cigars, that tobacco is at least a year old. So is that because it came from the original production? I don't know. But, oh, yeah. you know, sitting up for a year does happy things. Yes, it's, yes. Agreed, agreed. Very happy things. Because this came out, what, 2019? Is that yeah, right? yeah, just last year. So... This came out the same time that he did the, I believe it's uh, the, the Tricky Traqua, okay. which is a fantastic take on the Miquadira. Oh. It has a, like a maroonish kind of band to it, rather than that navy band. And I don't know if I tried that one. I don't think I've tried that. I would highly recommend trying that cigar. You know, I, I would not consider myself a, a, a Dumbarton fanboy by any means. I think he makes, he makes some very good cigars, but... I don't, I don't lose my mind over everything that he does. Okay. Um, 
it took me a little while to actually like Dunbar. The first time I tried the, the Summer Mason, which I think was his first release, mm -hmm. I, I didn't quite didn't quite get it. You know, then I tried the Miquadera, and I was like, okay, this is this is okay. And it really wasn't until the um, Torres Las Dias Mas Fuerte that he put out there. I was like, damn, this is pretty good. Mm. And so then I started getting back into the line and trying to go back through it. And the Miquadera, Miquadera is solid. Okay. And the Tricky Chakwa is even, even better. Um, the... Now, do you ever find any pause because of the price point? Yeah, I think that's what initially was okay. part of it. I think, you know, you, you you start getting into a price point. I mean, for the most part, they sit up above in that 10 to 15 range. Yeah. And you, unfortunately, I smoke a lot of Roma Craft. I love Roma Craft. So you get spoiled. At the price point, you mean? At the, yeah, because yeah, you get yeah. a fantastic product. The construction is on point. The flavors are there. They fit my flavor profile almost perfectly. Like, for me, I'm not a Connecticut kind of smoker. Um, but then you try going to something else, and it's just maybe it does actually sit in that price point or not. I don't know, you know. Um, I don't think I ever would go for the Unicorn because... That's the $100 one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The size... The size is cool. What's the size? It's, I think it's like a, I think it's like a six by sixty perfecto. It's a, it's a just oh, a so grand a, perfecto. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's kind of like the, uh, the release they did for the Weasel Craft, which I did smoke the entire box. But which Weasel Craft? Weasel, Weasel Fest. I'm sorry. I put oh, two the, things together. The, yeah. The, I've, the, already, the, the, I've already smoked through the whole you box. Smoked the whole bo I smoked the whole box. <laughs> it just came out last week. <laughs> I, I, well, there's eight, and there. This uh, is. It's been more than seven days. That okay. means, yeah, yeah, Tuesday was day eight. So Tuesday, I finished up the box with the baka. <laughs> so was there a best a best one? <sighs> so I, I should point out that for those of you watching, there's the. It's, what, what's it called? The, the cata 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 doris. Uh, cata doris or cata door. Cata doris de. Perfect. I don't. I don't remember. The grand it perfectos. Was, the grand perfectos. Yeah, cata doris de grand perfectos. So it's basically. Uh, a box of eight that were released for the Weasel Fest attendees to buy, and it's uh, Perfectos, right? Perfectos, mm -hmm. you said. Sixty Perfectos. Of, mm -hmm. What are this? There, and it's it's a tasting of the different lines. So it went, yeah, so it had pretty much one of everything. It had the Intemperance BA, the Intemperance BC, the Intemperance Whiskey Rebellion. Um, it had in there the Cro Magnon, Aquitaine, um, Wonderlust, uh, Neanderthal, and the Baca, which at this current time really is only the third shape of Baca that we've got to see. Yeah, yeah, I would like to see a bigger Baca. That, that small this is Pygmy a big Baca. Is, is like, it's, yeah. and Pygmy's too small for me. Pygmy was good. It was, it was great, and to be honest with you, it made me want to see that, like, um, like an anthropology a size. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, the anthropology size. Because for me, I, my favorite ring gauge is 46. Oh, 46, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That'd be good. That'd so, be good. you know, and it was, it was good. I'm a big fan of the Cro-Magnon series, so mm -hmm. I like Cro-Magnon. I thought the Neanderthal was going to be a lot like the HN, because... I remember you saying similar. that last week. Yeah, right, okay. It's fairly similar, you know, but, but it's no. the only Neanderthal that doesn't have a flat cap, because it's that perfecto size. Mm -hmm. um, and it was different, and it was... Really good. Does it have the same strength as the Neanderthal, the other Neanderthal? I don't know if I'm the right person to ask that. Okay. Because I don't. I've only gotten like, that I mean, strength from the Neanderthal a couple times, uh. and um, I don't know. I normally smoke pretty stout, some stout, heavier stuff. So. Because for me, the Neanderthal is a little bit. That's a little bit right at the edge of like where I can be because. It was nothing, nowhere near, it wasn't as bad as the LH. The LH was a little bit heavier than the Grand Perfecto. Okay, okay. In my, in that experience that I had. Um, oh, huh? Flat. Yeah. Oh, not bad. The LH also, um, I only got that feeling once and it could have been because I didn't eat. Believe that or not, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> but, well, it happens. It happens. Yeah, no. it happens. Uh, the first time I smoked the witchcraft from 18. Oh, that was a, that's a brutal cigar. That, that is, is a brutal, mm -hmm. brutal cigar. So every year, Roma Craft releases a, well, not every year, but they released one in 2013, 2014, 2018, 2019. And 2020. And 2020. But the f it's not, but in 2020, they didn't do the trumpet. There's this, like, no. that old school, like, trumpet style. What I used to call a torpedo, but I guess they call it trumpet. And man, that 2018 release was just, it's it was, like, it's pummeling you. Pummeling. It was a, that first time I smoked it, I was like, I thought I was going to be okay. I, I didn't, because I smoked Neanderthals. I knew, I thought the blend was based off the Neanderthal. I didn't think it was going to be a problem. And I'm sitting there at the tobacco leaf, and I'm smoking the first one out of that box. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this isn't normal. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, uh -huh. it's changed a lot. I still have two left. It's still it's still heavy. Man. It's, it's still, still heavy. It's changed a lot. As, okay, I've only had it. I had it once when it first came out, and so I brought the box to my friend's house, to Bud's house, and I'm sitting there. I'm smoking this cigar. Right? I'm sitting there like this, and it's so much power that I like the, the smoke is around me, and I'm trying to 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 get below the smoke because it's like. It's punching me in the face. The whole time. So I'm just like, oh my god, I need to, I need to hide. I need to hide from the smoke because it but was just know, too much. They said that LH is actually heavier than than that. I want. I, I think I've had the LH. I can't remember. I don't recall. But I, I, the, to me, the the strongest one of them all was that 2018. Like it's, it's to it's the up there. It's, it's to the there. point where like I paused to smoke them. I was like, oh god, am I ready to get beat down again? Hey. I like it. It's done happy things. It's good. It's good. <laughs> but you say it's changed. Like I've only had it. So I had one. I think just this earlier this summer. So this is the first time I. So I've, I think maybe maybe I've smoked three since I bought the box. Wait a minute. No. That's the one that has the band, right? The the, the metal band. It did have. Oh no! Metal I've band. smoked the entire box by now. But I, I don't. It's always been a power. But how does it change for you? It's married. Like that very first cigar, that very first one, that Candela was brighter. Okay. Like I first lit it and I could actually really pull and separate out the, that, that Mexican San Andreas, I believe is the, is the wrapper on there, but I could separate those things out. Now it's married and it's, it's. All those little sharp peaks and valleys uh -huh. have mellowed over. And I'll tell you, smoking it, I don't get the same strength that I did before. Mm. I'm going to have to revisit it. I'll revisit it when I feel brave again. Right. It's, uh, yeah. Now, are there any cigars out there that you're afraid of? You mean like because of the the power? Yeah. Oh, probably that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think there's any. Is there one you're afraid of that you think about? Not cigar, but I would say actually pipe tobacco can be stronger. Oh, yeah, yeah, like the Latakia kind of no, stuff? No, Latakia's not that strong. Oh, no, okay. No, but some stuff that is uh, like Kentucky Dark Fired, yeah, that's actually pretty potent stuff. And a lot of those blends are a little bit higher in that uh, vitamin N. And, um, but... Is it the same kind of stuff they're using in the, those Drew... Yeah. Okay, yeah. fire cured, whatever. Oh. Yep. Same, same stuff. Um, GLP's makes one that's actually really great. It's called um, Jackknife Pluck. And then they have another one called Triple Play, which adds Perique to it as well. Um, and both of those are fairly potent blends. Um, now, I'm not going to sit there and put it in a, in a giant magnum, but I will smoke it out of a big pipe, and it it's, can be fairly heavy. Mm. Um, that being said, McBaron just released probably one of the strongest tobaccos that you could smoke, and it's called Rustica. Oh. So, just like coffee, you have a Rustica, 
and you have an Arabica, right? There's Robusta, a, Robusta. Robusta, yeah. Right, right. But there's a, um, there's a uh, Rustica tobacco, which is similar. It's a smaller, more round plant that's was really too harsh for to be smoked. Um, during colonial time period, it wasn't gathered and collected for smoking because even during colonial time period, it said this is too rough. Oh. <laughs> Those are rough guys. So <laughs> they they focused more on this strain or tobacco now, which mostly came from the Caribbean region. Um, and it was brought into areas like Virginia and grown and cultivated and changed. And that's why you have Virginias or Burleys, uh, other Orientals. Most of that all came from originally in that Caribbean area. Um, Rustica was actually more native to this this area of the Americas. Now, they found somebody that is cultivating it. Um, I believe it might be from Africa. They blended oh. it with some other stuff. Um, but it's... It's strong. I haven't tried it. Everybody I've seen try it has tried it in very small pipes. And almost all of them say that it's a little bit too much. So, But you haven't tried it yet yourself. I haven't. I, I need to rectify this. But um, I am a little, I'm a little bit skeptical. Like, is it to the point where you get ill from smoking it? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. The guy, I've, we've been doing virtual pipe clubs. Right. Feedings uh, through this, which has been fantastic. And there's a couple times where a couple guys will say, all right, I'm going to try it. And they'll, they'll try it on the, and you can see the change in the video of them as they're smoking this. And you start to see they're, they're sitting deeper in their seat. <laughs> and, you know, they're looking around a little bit more. And then the one... Sometimes like, all right, I, I've got to go get a cookie or sugar or soda or something because have you ever tried that? What cookie? Or yeah. Soda. As if you're getting having too much nicotine, you get, eat some sugar, and you'll bounce right back. That's usually why I'm drinking Diet Coke. Okay, but of course that's not real sugar, so yeah, I don't know if that has the same effect. Possibly, but that's um. I know a couple guys that you start to see they start to get the, the sweats, mm, and yeah. then they uh, brutal, it's yeah, brutal. yeah, and then you're like, all right, this guy needs some help. He goes, here, eat a cookie, you know, or have a piece of chocolate. Chocolate normally is really good, and that that clears it up. It really, it, it it's like giving the zombie a vaccine. I'm gonna try that next time if I get to start getting ill. But a lot of times I will drink Coke. Just because I like the, the, actually, I like the flavor balance to it. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say the Coke, because Yasser, down at Tobacco Leaf, uh -huh. we were talking one day, and he mentioned root beer. And I normally don't like carbonated beverages, because I don't like the way it plays on my tongue with the cigar. Beer, soda, sparkling, whatever. I normally don't go that way. Okay. Uh, when I'm smoking a cigar. But um, in the time being since, that stuck in my head. And I started doing it. And now I I went out to go have a cigar last night. And I was like, damn, I'm out of root beer. <laughs> so, now, is there a preferred root beer? You know... I've smoked, or I've been picking up Virgil's. Oh yes, it is a sugar-free because um, yeah, we don't. Need I got more. we don't need more sugar. That's I know. for sure. Yeah, I gotta try to to at least behave, especially if I want to have a quantity over one in the house. Um, oh, yes, 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 yes. And and Haynes also has a sugar-free. I think it's Haynes, but it's it's a little bit more than natural. And both of those have been really good. Um, there's a couple of brands that I really I do want to try, um, but I, I like that really that really thick, heavier root beer that you taste a little bit more of that um, those herbal notes in there. So the other thing I I started doing, 
or is thinking about, can I replicate this in a cocktail? Ah, okay. So what I started doing is looking at Amaros because of the, all the, the herbal qualities and different Amaros and then looking at a little bit more of the bitters and kind of trying to think about how can I make a play on, say, an old fashioned with doing some of these things. Hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll go with a, um, a bourbon, or actually the last time, which worked, started working more towards a positive direction, was the Woodford Wheat, because that's more of a weeded whiskey, and not necessarily a weeded bourbon. Okay. Um, not like Weller would be a weeded bourbon, um, of course, Pappy would be a weeded bourbon. Makers is your probably most popular weeded bourbon, but this is more of a wheat based whiskey. And that, I paired that with um, an Amaro, which I will not be able to remember the name of right okay. now. <laughs> it and happens. It happens. I also found these uh, bitters. Um, I believe it was uh, Fee Brothers, but it was a black walnut bitter. So it's almost like the Nocachino you know, uh, Amaro liqueur. Mm. And so they're, the bitters themselves are are very herbal in their flavor. Um, and that actually, that was the first one that I said, okay, I'm starting to get to a place where I can play with and start to kind of look at it a little bit deeper and see, okay, what do I need to do to make this a little bit different? So it was good. Huh. But it's not, it's not exactly like a, a one-to-one -one replacement for the no the flavor profile of a, of a root beer. No, no. It's same with when we talk about the flavors in the coffee, the flavor in the cigar. Mm. You know, it's you're not, and it's where people look at. My favorite flavor descriptor is barnyard. When you get a cigar and it has it says you hear somebody say notes of barnyard. Is that a good thing? Because <laughs> that reminiscence. That exactly, exactly. Coffee's changed a lot as it's as it's cooled. Yeah. It doesn't have that strong berryness anymore. No. Did I tell you what I started doing at home though? No. So I can't remember what it's called, but you know, if you do have a chance to travel to Italy, you know, you go up there to the cafe and you'll see espresso straight up and it's like a 125 or 135 right and mm. then you see like this uh chacuado chicanito or something it's like shaken right oh chicorado yeah chicorado yeah, yeah. yeah chicorado and yes. it's it's like um you look at it you're like yeah it's like two three times the price and yes. i talked to some of my friends that are there and they're like yes in the summertime i don't know we spend too much money on this thing it's just you know, espresso and ice and some sugar, and it's shaken up. Right? Yes, yes, but yes. It does happy things. It starts to aerate and blend it. So, and you get that foaminess. Yeah, yeah. Plus the broken like ice cubes. Right. And I, you know, initially I would put it in a shaker, put it in a thermos, and shake it up real good. And I would get some of those qualities and characteristics. And I, I actually now in the summertime, I will do that also with my coffee in the morning. Um, so I'll go through a, just a, a Bilotti pot at home. Mm -hmm. But during the weekend, I have a little bit more time, and I don't have to worry about waking people up because I'm... So what do you do? You pick the, you, you brew the, co the coffee of the Bialetti. Yeah. And then you pour it into the shaker. No. No. Now? <laughs> I go the lazy way. I put the ice and the sugar in a blender. <laughs> I just pour it in, and I just hit liquefy <laughs> until it gets really nice and foamy. <laughs> But it's great. That, isn't that more like a, a shake rather than a, a shaken drink? Uh, yes and no, because the ice starts to break down immediately, and you're you're when you're going in there, you're more just bringing in foam. But isn't the idea with the shaker on that you're like you're trying you you will so you'll shake the so like you said the shaker is basically in, in most places they take a shaker they put the espresso ice sugar and then they shake it. And then they use the strainer inside the shaker to pour it out, which, which leaves those bits. It holds the ice back, but leaves the foam and leaves bits of ice in the drink. So, I mean, but it's, it's, this is much more ice. 
Not really. No. Okay. I'm not using that much more ice. And if you get it right, if you get the temperature of the coffee is right, you'll still get a little bit of those little bits of ice in there. But you get a lot of, that first few sips, you get a lot of really nice, light, sweet, you know, oh. foam. Oh. And as it, it sits for a little while, it'll start to separate out. But you need to get a little bit of stir, and that foam sits right there on top. And um, it's cool. And okay, is it a little bit lazy? Is it not traditional? <laughs> Absolutely. What what is traditional anyway? Mm -hmm. Right. But you know, um, and that's like this. It's sweet. Is that traditional? But it doesn't mean that's bad. No. Yeah. No. Exactly. It's just different. And you know, what blows my mind is is the guys that have that one brand, that one blend. And that's all they go to. You know, there's a lot more out there that, you know, you, you almost, you almost fit, your mind, your mind makes changes, you know, and it knows the change in the seasons, and your mind makes those decisions, hey, I want to have this flavor profile now. You know, I'm, I'm not really in the middle of summer looking to braise some, you know, some meats, you know, <laughs> besides making the kitchen like, you know, inferno hot. Right, right. It, it, it's like, you know, I, my mind doesn't say, I want that really heavy braised dish. I'm keeping things a little bit more on the lighter side, or at least a little bit on the lighter side. Oh, we got Rusty asking a question again. His question is, have you ever tried pairing a cigar with iced coffee as opposed to hot brewed coffee? That's exactly what I do. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. No, he, he's absolutely right. And that's... Now... I'll, when it's hot out, my mind makes a change from pipe tobacco to cigars. So my cigar consumption during the summer goes up a lot more. Oh. And I don't smoke my pipe as often. But, you know, recently we've had a nice little break in the weather. So I've been breaking the pipe out a little bit more. You mean this past week? This past week, yeah. Okay. And But during the weekend, you get a nice coffee, it's chilled, some, you know, a good cigar, pipe tobacco, you get to sit outside, you hear the world wake up, and um, it's good. Thanks. It's good. Well, you know, it's interesting, like, what he's saying is, like, with the, using iced coffee as opposed to the hot, like, mm -hmm. We have this coffee that we use for our cold brew at the shop. It's uh, what we call the Pearl Negra. And it's actually made for us by the, a, f a f family in um, Matagalpa, Nicaragua, which is about an hour from Esteli. And what it is, it's, um, it's a coffee that we kind of stumbled upon a few years back where they, would, they do something called um, anaerobic, anaerobic fermentation. So they're taking the coffee and they're processing it in a low oxygen environment. I, I don't think it, like anaerobic, when people talk about anaerobic, like in, in coffee, the coffee world over the last five years, anaerobic processing has become kind of a thing. We started ours in like 2015, so we were like one of the first to use this, but I don't quite think anaerobic is the, uh, the, the precise term because anaerobic would mean, you know, without oxygen, right? Yeah. I don't think it's possible at all to do this fermentation in a complete zero oxygen environment. But anyway, what this this coffee, what this process does, it causes malolactic fermentation, and that malolactic fermentation it, it can impart milky notes to the coffee, and so it, at the very extreme, it like when we taste when we're testing it, we tasted one that was at the extreme was very blue cheese. Like it, you drank it, and you're like, it's like blue cheese. It's freaky. Just freaking dishes. You're just like, what is going on here, right? But where we started to get to this, to the anaerobic fermentation for our iced coffee was that we, we sampled some that were not as dramatic. So as the coffee cooled in our tasting session with it, it became very sweet. Mm -hmm. It became very milky, very creamy, to the point that we actually called it black cappuccino because it, when you're drinking it, especially in a chilled form, it really had a sweet, like milky character, like you were drinking a cappuccino without yeah. any milk and sugar. I think now that we're smoking this, and now that Rusty brought this question up, I think that would be great with this cigar Absolutely. because of the creaminess. Absolutely, of this. that coffee. 
I remember going into your shop, and I w went in there to pick up a bag of Esteli. Mm. And, you know, we started talking a little bit, and you asked me what did I like about the Esteli. And then you said, you know, I think you should try the Perla Negra. And, and I, I remember getting it, and I was like, man, this is really good. And now oh, thank you. I, I'm, uh, I've been spoiled. <laughs> you know? And you kind of like, it, you're chasing the dragon <laughs> a little bit. Say, you know, comparing it, like, you know, you're looking at your brewing process. You're, you're looking at, okay, am I doing all this stuff right? You know, and you realize that you're doing everything right. And it's the same coffee. You've had this coffee before. I had it, you know, last year. And I remember it. And it was good. I enjoyed it a lot. But now, it just doesn't taste the same. Mm. So it's, um, ah, it is yeah, what it is. It is what it is. Well, actually, interesting connection. Like, um, like I mentioned earlier that uh, our friend came by before we started tonight with his mom. And um, we made it, I made it that coffee. So our friend happened to stop by earlier and brought her his mom and was like, hey, can you make us a coffee? I was like, well, okay, why not? <laughs> can't say no to your mom. I would say no to him, but I can't say no to his mom. You know? <laughs> but the coffee that I made was this thing called the sea salt massage coffee. And that was done for us by Rusty's mom. So Rusty's mom is, runs a place called Rusty's Hawaiian Kona Coffee, uh -huh. which was named after the father. The father's name is Rusty as well. And so okay. the coffee that I made for the mom, for Eric's mom, was made by Rusty's mom. Oh, cool. Ah, that's kind of neat. That's, I, I had no, you know, had no thought about that, but just realized yeah. now. And when you were making that coffee, you were telling her the story of that coffee. It was actually, it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a really... She, I think that... Uh, of like there's a lot of coffee been grown in Hawaii and Kona is well known mm -hmm. Kau is a region of, of coffee growing south of Kona about three hours south and I think his mom makes the very best coffee yeah. in all of Hawaii so therefore all of the United States and she's definitely one of the premier coffee producers in the world I mean it's every stuff we've ever tried from her has been like Outstanding, just yeah. stellar, stellar. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but based off of my understanding, sometimes convincing some of these farmers to set aside some of their production to take the extra time and effort to increase the quality of the beans can sometimes be uh, a little bit difficult. It can be, but you know, uh, it's in, in some ways it's it's a little. I, I consider it to be a little bit misnomer in that respect. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Rusty's mom. Right. Lori is her name. This woman, uh, when I first met her, she's a short Filipino lady, kind of reminds me of my mom. And when I first met her, which was back in 2008, one of my other friends, um, Miguel Meza, he's, um, he's also a cigar guy, but he's in the coffee business, and he was like, hey man, you need to go meet this woman. So I, have, I went to the Big Island, and I, w I went to her farm, and I met her, and this is a woman obsessed with making like just amazing quality, just... So someone like her, you don't have to convince, but I, when, I, when I say it's kind of a misnomer is that, you know, there's a lot of coffee being produced in the world that, that is on a quality scale, okay, maybe not the best quality, right? I think a lot of that has to do with the resources available to those farmers. Right. You know, not all of them, a lot of them are doing it because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily chosen. And it wasn't, um, like, um, the, the reality is that we, uh, in, my, in my business of us, of us buying coffee from farms, we tend to buy very high quality coffee. Mm -hmm. And the, the difficult reality of that is, is that the, the people that are able to do quality coffee year in, year out, are invariably people of the higher percentages of society that have, you know, financial resources, education, they've got just a world of resources. Like, you know, it's, in, in the coffee business, we, we like to talk about, a lot of people in the business like to talk about, oh, we're working with this small campesino farmer and we won't, we're only buying the best quality coffee. Well, the problem is with that campesino farmer is that they just don't have the resources. And so like we were working on this project in, 
2014, we were working with an importer called, um, out of New York City, um, Crop the Cup. And we were visiting these farms in Mexico, trying to find high quality coffee. And we ended up work, trying to work with this one group of farmers in, um, in the state of Guerrero. And it's a really interesting place, beautiful like location, way at the top of the mountain. The potential for quality is, is totally there. The problem is that it's a disparate group of farmers, meaning that some of them had a lot of resources, a lot of them didn't. And, you know, here you are, and a lot of the coffee buyers that I know, they, they want to buy the best quality, and that's fine. And we rate, like in cigars, we rate coffees on a scale of like one to a hundred. So above 80 is where you want to be. Mm -hmm. The higher up you go, the better it is. And so a lot of these buyers will tell, will tell these farmers, hey, we want you to do an 86 coffee, right? Maybe they're doing like 80, 82. But we want you to pay, we want you to make 86 quality coffee and we'll pay you a premium for that 86 quality coffee. Well, the problem is, it's like these farmers, they're selling their coffee, their green, their, uh, their red, harvested coffee, not processed, to what they call coyotes. And the coyotes will just buy whatever they have and give them whatever money. It's typically pretty low and then they'll process it and it becomes commercial coffee. And yeah. so it, it, and they'll pay whatever price. And the thing is that the buy, a lot of the buyers that, that I, I know of, they'll tell them, hey, we'll pay you this percentage more mm -hmm. if, you do, if you deliver this level of quality. But the problem is, it takes another two months for them to to try to produce that. Right. They don't have the they don't have the capital to sustain their family. They gotta they gotta feed their families tomorrow. Yeah. They gotta their children need to eat tomorrow, not three months from now. Right. And it's one of those things where, like, if in three months you've only produced a coffee that reaches eighty four, not eighty six, well, deals off. Yeah. So they're completely screwed. So there's a, that's one of the, the conundrums that I find in, in, in coffee buying that, that it's like, which is why in, in the times when we work with farms and we're like, hey, like we work with a group of tribal farmers in the Philippines and, I, and I, one year we had this idea of like, hey, let's do this river washing of the coffee. And I told them, well, we will pay for the entire production up front mm -hmm. so that if it turns out to be total, if, if it just turns out to be nothing, we'll still take delivery of the coffee, we'll, and we'll still pay you the price for it. Right. Because otherwise, you know, you, they've got all this extra work and extra time mm -hmm. that they really can't afford. Yeah. To be honest, that's coming from talking about coffee production in areas like Hawaii, where you know, okay, you have more resources, but you also don't have as much. The premium for land is higher. So the end product, if the end product is greater, you're making the best re use of the resource of the land itself and the value of the land. So I guess that's why I kind of le led into that. What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. expensive. Super exactly. Expensive. So, you know, you want, you got to have the product that's, at, that's also at a premium. So, yeah, but, but it also ties into resources, like you said. I, well, one of the problems with, with, like, with Hawaii, with Kona, is that, Oh, I, I should clarify. Rusty was saying Kau, not Kona. I did say Kau, and said that she's producing south of Kona, just in case. But, Thanks, Rusty. <laughs> but you know, one of the things is, and, and on a quality spectrum, like there, are, there are certain companies in Kona that make amazing quality. Yeah. Um, but on a, on an overall spectrum, the coffee quality is. Is good. Okay. It's not quite necessarily commensurate with the the price you pay, but I think. But also the the other side of that is that in Kona you are paying you as a farmer you're paying like you said high ra high rates for the land, especially in Kona, mm -hmm. and you're also paying high rates for labor. Oh yeah. I mean you're paying American wages, and yeah. so that's that's a significant difference. Like, let's say in, in a lot of the producing countries they they'll. Um, Let's say the, the the farmer, the the pickers, right? The pickers will come and they will. Let's say typically you'll measure out that you'll, you'll harvest the cherries, and you'll take the coffee, or, or they'll take the coffee, and then they measure it 
uh, in some countries it's called the aroba. Yeah. And the aroba is this kind of a bucket shaped thing. They pour the coffee in, they measure it. And it's a rough measurement. So it's more or less 25 pounds. Kind of like a bushel. Right, exactly. And so they'll pay, let's say, a dollar fifty per aroba. And so, and so a farmer, uh, a, a, a field worker, may only make, you know, eight dollars. Wow. That day, which yeah. for them, that's quite a lot. For, and, and you know, in a lot of the farms that we work with in Central America, and I, I meet a lot of these workers, and, and they seem very happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they seem to have good living conditions. And so it's hard for me to, to, to yeah. juxtapose that. But on the Kona side, or in the American side, I mean, you're paying 15 yeah. to $20 an hour for these right. people. So, yeah. so for me, that background came from, um, I can't remember the, the guy who, who, his name, but there was a, a book called The Monk of Mocha. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and it, it was cool about, you know, him trying to revitalize coffee production in Yemen, where really it, it came from. And, you know, going through that, that the quality really wasn't there. And he was trying to, to reinvigor the guys to, hey, we can do better. We can make world-class coffee here. And his, besides all the other craziness that goes inside that book, it was interesting to hear the aspects of the production as well. Oh, yeah. I, I need to read that because, you know, I know a guy that, that, um, that, I don't know if he's the business partner of the Mocha Mocha guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he, I, American guy. Yeah. You meet him, he's all, he's a big guy. He's got a beard. He looks very like, looks like he lives in the Middle East. And he did live in the Middle East. He mm -hmm. lived in Yemen. He actually got kidnapped twice. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh my God, dude. He was telling me a story. I was like, holy crap, that's yeah. crazy. I think one of those stories is actually in the book. Oh, is it? I need yeah, to Yeah, he actually talked that. about kidnapping in there. Um, but, but he told me that it was one of the kidnappings. He was they were very well. They treated him very well. He was yeah. like, okay. But the, uh, this, I think the second one, they didn't treat him so well. So he left the uh, country. Did he leave the country I don't in this know. book? It, he did, but they, they left because of political unrest, more or less. Well, yeah, I mean, they're in war now, so. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, the, I gotta admit, so my wife is, is a librarian. She works at Baltimore County Libraries. Um, she does a, a fantastic job with that. And so she's cued into it. So we actually tagged into Libby and got the book on tape. Oh. So we went camping and uh, you know, we downloaded the book and we're able, we listened to, to it while we were driving. While we're sitting out by the campfire, we had it on, and we're listening to them you know, go through the story and tell the story. Um, but if you have a Baltimore County Library card, or I believe a Maryland Library card, you can go on to Libby and then pull that and essentially borrow that book. Especially times like this where you're, you're not really going to the library. I think now they they just started a curbside service. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. You can uh, borrow a book, drive up. They'll bring the book out to you, and uh, and that's it. But um, using for you know, things like Libby, you don't have to do that. You can pull it down from you know while we're sitting here. Huh? I have to look into that. That's bcpl.net, right? Is that right? Dot net. I, I couldn't tell. I you. spent I, six I, years I at the used, library. I just so used I don't know. Google. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it, it was it was very interesting. So. Yeah, that's good. I, who who narrates that book? Is it him or? It's been about a year. Okay. okay. So um, I, I really couldn't tell you his name or who narrates the book, but um, it was good. It was it was. I'm not really a book on tape person, but um, no, I, I, think I it thoroughly fun. enjoyed it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about that book. Well, you know, the interesting thing that I I, I discovered not too long ago is that. I've been to Saudi Arabia like four times now to do their competitions. And my friends, I think it was my last trip, they were showing me photos of, um, the, evidently they, I didn't know this, but at the, they actually grow coffee in Saudi Arabia in the southern part of the country, basically mm -hmm. along the border with Yemen. Okay. And you know, you have this, even going to Riyadh, you have this whole image of Saudi Arabia being this arid desert country. But where they grow the coffee, it's like green and mountainous. Yeah. It looks, it's really white, 
quite remarkable. Yeah. Like, I remember he, he talked about that in the book. And he talked about when he was a kid, I think his uh, grandfather had, uh, you know, property there. And he talked about seeing, like, these cherries growing on the tree. and remember eating them. And they were coffee plants. So he did no idea as a kid that these were coffee plants. But when he got older, he got a, an appreciation. And that's what kind of started driving that, that, um, that sense of trying to revitalize coffee production. And I guess when I say that, it's more or less, um, when I say revitalize, I mean bringing the coffee quality up. Oh, uh, yes, know, yes. You know, not necessarily that commercial grade mm -hmm. kind of coffee. So, but it was interesting. The Yemeni coffee is quite interesting. Like they, they age it, right, in caves. Did he talk about that or? I don't recall. Okay. okay. I, I haven't dealt too much with Yemeni coffee because it's so difficult to get Yeah. In, in, in America today, especially with the war going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that was, it was very good. So has the sweetness changed? Well, it's not, it's no longer like, when you start, the, the the sweetness is really here on the on the on the wrapper at, at where you're where you're inhaling. But the sweetness has for, for about this long, the sweetness has been in the cigar, mm -hmm. but not a not a sugary sweetness, just a very pleasant tobacco sweetness. Right. Even being right here where I am, I can. It's not as up front, but it's still there. Yeah. You know, and some of that might be me getting used to it, my palate adjusting to it. Um, but it's still very enjoyable, very good. Um, now, here's the big question Does it sit at that price point? $14. Yep. It's a loaded question. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I want, it's a yes for me. It's a yes and no answer. Yes, in the fact that it's a, it's a like look if if you look at the, if you look at the wrapper, right? It's, I need to put more light here, but basically the wrapper is still very tight. It's very silky. Still, it's still, it's still a very. I mean, it's a well constructed cigar. Oh yeah, it's a great cigar overall. I'm just not one that, once you get past $12, mm -hmm. that is just like, uh, suddenly I'm like, oh God, I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend too much money. Yeah. Especially so, down with the, the COVID, it's like, good God, I can't afford to spend right. that kind of money. Well, during, during this, you know, I don't have a big, you know, hero. I got a, a little small humidor, and it, before it never was, I uh, never thought about it, because, you know, on the weekends, I would go hang out in the cigar shop. I normally go down the tobacco leaf, right. um, or it, the humidor. It's tobacco leaf in Jessup, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Raul. Yeah. Or, you know, our pipe club would meet at the humidor, uh -huh. which is right up here in uh, Cockeysville. Yeah, yeah, just across the street, five hundred yards <laughs> away. From it. Not even five hundred yards. So, you know, um, now. I have my box, which normally has stuff that I don't really want to smoke that much of. But I kind of want to let it some this sit. But I find myself running out of the everyday stuff and <laughs> going into that a little bit more. Into the luxury <laughs> stuff. Right. And, uh, you know, so I, I swung into the humidor today and I picked up some stuff just to have for, you know, the weekend and whatnot. Um, just so I don't have to always dive into... The stuff that I rather not smoke right now. Yeah, I hear you. I hear, and, and, and that's the thing for me. It's like, like my, my favorite cigars tend to be. You know, my favorite cigars are the Paul Gamir and Bellicose Maduro, the PDR Siri Pravada 1975 SP54, the Kohonu Tatuai 2003, mm -hmm. the, and the Roma Craft Revenge. Right, and yeah. so. Of all of those four, those top four, only the revenge is under ten dollars, <laughs> right? And usually it's significantly below ten dollars. Yeah, like you can get it. 
depending where you shop, it can be down to seven fifty a cigar. Right. So it really has being a cigars that are above the twelve dollar price point have really curbed my selection of those. Yeah. No. Especially when you've got something like Roma that is of excellent quality. Yep. Great flavor experience. Yep. And pretty much everything like if you if it's above ten dollars, it's kind of a so you're like what cigar is that? Well, like it's surprising. Yeah, it's like, you know, yeah, ex yeah, absolutely. But it's kind of like um, that's why I, I come back to this now. <coughs> after that, and this is a once in a while when I want something different. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I, I wouldn't say I would go to a shop and you know every week and buy one of these, or I wouldn't be. I wouldn't say uh, I have to get a box of this. Right. I would say that every once in a while, I would. I'd want to pick this up, you know, and. Oh, your wife just said she found us. Oh, <laughs> hi, Ari. Hey, hi. <laughs> we're, we're not too. We're not, we can't touch. See? We can't touch. Can't touch. Look at <laughs> <that>. <laughs> uh, you were saying sorry. Um. Yeah. The, but yeah, it's not an everyday thing. It's a once in a while thing when I want that experience. Now, I will say the last one I had of this was that Grand Corona or Double Corona, whatever he's calling it. The thing that's not a Corona, but it's called a Corona. Okay. Because it's 54 ring. It's, you know, it's six plus inches. And that cigar burns for a really long time. And this is better. Oh. With that one, I lost, I lost some of that sweetness a lot earlier on. This one, it stays, it stays with it. So she says we're still a little close. <laughs> it's just, it's trickery of the camera. It's just trickery. We, we, I actually sized down the lens, the focal length, to make it look tighter. Otherwise, it's otherwise we'd be like this. Oh, wrong way. Otherwise, it's like that. Right? So just kind of made it a little bit tighter to. Oh, too tight. Oh, gosh. There we go. <laughs> made it a little bit tighter just to make it look better in the frame. Yeah. I hope she caught oh, that. Oh, but she says we're looking good, though. Well, oh, all right. Thank on, you. All right. Right. I hope she caught that plug for BCPL. I hope so. I hope so. She, <laughs> we're talking about BCP, BCPL.net. Correct us if we're wrong, please. <laughs> <laughs> but she actually, uh, speaking of that, too, all this stuff with COVID, you know, she, she's doing a lot of stuff also online with uh, my librarian appointments okay. and things like that. So, you know, people still need help and assistance, you know, through their regular everyday life that the library provided for them as a resource. And um, they can still get some of those resources by, you know, going on, making an appointment with librarians and doing it remotely, you know, through the phones or video chats or, or things like that. So, um, Well, I was always like it. Like for Spro, when we started Spro in 2006, our first location was at the, the Baltimore County Public Library in Towson. And so we spent six years there, and I was. You know, when, you, when we first started going in there, it was one of those things where you, libraries were something that were so, so far removed from school. Mm -hmm. But man, there's so much great resources at the library. Oh, yeah. I was just so amazed. I, I miss, actually, I miss going there on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, uh, just from what I get to hear when she comes back from work and she talks about her day and she talks about what she's done with people to help them in the community, um, it's it's impressive. And, uh, agreed. I'm, agreed. I'm extremely proud of her for what she does and how she's able to help. I mean, she's helping people find jobs and find employment and, you know, better their lives. So, yeah. BCPL. Right on, right on. <laughs> but back to what you're saying, like, I think this, I, I think, is very well made. Like, it's... Yes. Yeah, I can I see... I mean... For, for 13, I can see that. I can see it. It hasn't walked. It hasn't done anything. It's razor flat. Um, yeah, the burn's been very consistent and right. even the whole time. I mean, even if I'm going fast. Yeah. 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 Or you're going slow, because, I mean... You can go slow, and all of a sudden you start having burn issues, and it starts going out. Maybe not true. You know, it, it starts to you know. Um, oh yeah, and it hasn't gone out at all. Tunnel or 
Yeah. So, with that set in mind, if you went the other side of the spectrum where you have those artificially sweetened things, they can't hold a candle to this. No, no, definitely, definitely not. Definitely. So, if you want something different, you understand that there is going to be a sweetness. It's not going to be a shocker. It's you got to make your own opinion. You got. I would say you got to at least try it. I agree. I agree. And you know, it's when I started smoking cigars in the '90s, Connecticut was very big. Mm -hmm. It was a very. It was kind of normal. And then I guess it kind of went away in, in favor, and now it's coming back. And it, it, this is different. It's much more advanced, I would say, than, than what we've had in the past. Like, this is actually a really well-constructed, well-flavored, well-balanced, <clears throat> yeah. well-balanced. Because a lot of people that you, I talk to now, it's like they, they'll talk about, you hear them talk about Connecticut, they're like, oh, I don't want Connecticut, it's too light, it's too this, too that, it's, it's not. And I, and I wonder also, like, in this world of, of boutique cigars now where a lot of stuff that have come out is just about power and fla you know, so flavor yeah. you know you know it, it's funny when we when I used to work at a, a cigar shop we would have people come in and it might be their first cigar and a lot of guys they say they start them off with something milder you know a, a Connecticut you know something and that never rang true for me you know I'm like, yeah, you can start here, but let's start with something that's a little bit milder, maybe in strength, but still more medium body, maybe even medium full body mm. in flavor, because you need to taste it. You need to experience what it can be. Same thing with pipe tobacco. Man, every time somebody would come in there and say, they would say, want to start with this aromatic pipe tobacco, because they might have that memory of somebody smoking something that was sweet. But so maybe, it's more accessible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thinking is the thinking. Yeah, but you have that artificial sweetness that does not translate into the flavor. It ends up being almost sometimes almost flavorless, hmm. and you just have an aromatic smell which you can't even smell when you're when you're smoking. So, I would normally try to steer them to something that was more natural flavor because that natural flavor you get a depth. You get a depth that you cannot get with an artificial. And that's why I think it absolutely would be possible that you can have a natural flavored cigar that's this sweet because it doesn't, it has a depth. It doesn't have that, that fleeting artificial kind of, you know, dead fish kind of thing. <laughs> you know, to be honest. <laughs> dead fish I like yeah. that it's like a, it's like a dead fish you know it has no life right right but this has a life so is it possible to be naturally this sweet hey I guess anything's possible but it's still but the, the conundrum is still that if you licked down like two inches down the cigar that sweetness wasn't there yeah I mean it's 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 not super sweet, but it's all, it is pronounced, it is a pronounced sweetness, mm -hmm. but it's not in the rest of the, the wrapper. But where you, where if it was truly, you would expect it to be, wouldn't you expect it, I would expect it to be the rest of the, the length. Do you almost think that it might be coming from the binder rather than the wrapper? They're focusing so much on the wrapper. Yeah, but what did, I mean, like, you mean that the, the sweetness is coming out of the wrapper, out of the binder, into the wrapper? Well, more or less, when you, when you cut it, like, I don't, I don't punch it, I don't use a V-cut, I normally like to cut it, and for this, we both cut it. Right. So, we're getting exposure of some of that wrapper in that cut. In the binder. Oh, excuse me, out of the binder, yes. Yeah, but, but, yeah, that, that could be, but that would be just this real small, narrow... Oh, I know, yeah. It's just a hypothetical. Okay. <laughs> You're right. The percentage that you actually get exposed to is almost negligible. But is it possible? <laughs> I guess anything's possible. <laughs> right. <laughs> I tell you, Christ is possible to come back. So that's true. That's true. 
or you could be like some of those lunatics that think COVID is a way of injecting a vaccine that could track you because it's the end of days. I, I don't know. <laughs> but it is. It totally is. So, how's it burning for you now? I'm still solid. Flavor still good? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty close. So it's starting to get a little bit bitey. It is starting. And I don't know, maybe that could be that I, I smoke harder than you, but maybe it's starting to get a little bit bitey. But it, not unpleasant. Looking at your cigar, mm -hmm. my cigar down where it makes contact with my mouth has more moisture on the wrapper than yours does. So uh, Yeah, I try honestly, not to be I try not to be too wet. Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna show you mine. I, I I'm I'm sorry. It, it's not gonna happen. It's alright, that's all right. <laughs> I don't think they want to see that. No, you you don't. You don't. Now, I'm not a chewer. You, you, get, you ever see those guys? Oh, that are chewing on it? That, yeah, 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 yeah. When, I was, that, when, when I was working in a restaurant, you know, uh, in Maryland, I think they banned smoking in like 2009. And oh, I think it was earlier. Was it? 2007, I think. Different counties banned it before. Howard County went non-smoking prior to the state of Maryland. It might have been before. Because mm. um, I think when D.C. stopped, it was 2007. Okay. Either way... Long after that, we'd still have a guy that would come in, order a cognac, and he would dip his cigar in the cognac, and he'd just sit there with an unlit cigar, just chewing on it. Oh, well, that's a guy who loves cigars. <laughs> I, I don't know what he loves, but I, I, he, I don't know if he, he actually loves smoking cigars. I think he might just like... Dipping cognac. Having a, yeah, having something in his mouth. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, that's good. So, so what about you? What's your do you have Do you have like favorite cigars? Well, I, I would say the Cro Magnon is right up there with one of my favorite cigars. Um, I also really like the Neanderthal and the SGP is actually a size I typically go to. Although, in that pack, they did. There might have, may have been a cigar that was a more Corona-shaped Neanderthal, and that was um, that was really good. <laughs> that was really good. So, I, I that may now be my new favorite size on that, which makes sense because it's a 46 ring. I, 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 that's what you like. I, that's what I like. But there's no plans for them to make that as a normal release. I don't think in the States. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I think it might be a regular production release elsewhere. Oh, we're speaking of cigars that are not in the United States. Mm -hmm. So in that, that, that box you had, yes, there was a, uh, a Wonderlust version of it, right? I don't know how it got there. But how is that, how is that compared to the other Wonderlust you had? Do you recall? Yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, you know that Grand Perfecto size is different. Is is different. It took me a few cigars to really figure out how to smoke that size. Hmm. Um, man, you really got to slow down. I have to make a conscious effort to slow down and smoke that cigar. And when you do slow down, it it opens up and it's really nice. Now. I do oh, have, well, your, your wife says it was 2007. Okay, thank you, Ari. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but I, I've got to slow, slow down. Now, I have more of them. I have another box, so I have one more of each. Oh, you have two boxes. I did get two boxes. Oh, man, you're a lucky guy. Um, but I, once again, getting back to that, they're on the bottom of my humidor, covered by, up you by are, everything. You. <laughs> so if I I gotta dig for it, <laughs> so one of the, I don't see preventative it. measures. Right, I don't see it. I might not grab it. 
I mean, that is one of the problems. When you get a nice cigar and you have a box, you tend to blow through them. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, the, like I told you, I think my favorite overall cigar has been the PG Bellicosa Maduro. Yeah. I have a box at home that I never open because once it opens, I will go through the entire thing and then I'll be out. Then it's like, oh man, now I don't have any more. I know. I'm so like scared to try it. But you hold on, you hold on to those things so much. All right. Well, let's talk about. Let's go back to my box because it's, you know, it, I could I only keep maybe 50 cigars in that box. Okay. Right. So I mean, I get a whole box and I'm like, oh shit, where am I gonna put everything? Um, but you, you have that cigar that you don't. That Do you still have beverage, by the way? Um, actually, yeah, I still have a little bit. I mean, would you like a, another beverage? Uh, yeah, sure. You know, it be, might be good just to try yeah, something yeah. else for the end of this. All right, so we have a choice: Florida Cana Seven Rum or mm -hmm. Old Line Aged Caribbean Navy Strength. That's a local rum, isn't it? That's a local. I don't know if they actually produce it or they have someone else produce it for them. Right. But they're based in Baltimore. They are based here, yes. Uh, you know, I haven't tried that yet. Okay. okay. Let's let's go for that. You like it neat or... Well, let's, yeah, let's do it neat. Okay. Okay. So we've got the old line. Uh, Navy strength. Age Caribbean. The reason I got this, I found this website, and I, don't, I must have... Those of you who are watching at home, I, I think I mentioned this last week, but I got this... Because I was reading this, um, this, I found this website called uh, rumreviews.com. Yeah. And I thought it was a panel of people that were tasting it, but it turns out it's just an aggregation of like people all over the world that are drinking rums. Okay. And I was at the local, my local shop, which is uh, the wine source in Hamden. <laughs> and basically, I'm like looking at their their rums, and I and they do a um, they do a rating system, you know, one to ten. So I was looking for anything above eight. And this one, I think, it was eight point seven. Okay. And uh, so that's that's how I got this one. So uh, now it says age. Do they give an age statement? Do they give what? An age statement. Oh, good question. Say, let me see. Oh, age seven years Caribbean rum. Not for the faint of heart. Our one hundred fourteen proof Navy strength Caribbean rum is bold but nicely mellowed after seven years in the barrel. Distilled and cask aged in the tropics, it stands strong in a cocktail, neat, or with a cube. So, oh yeah, so product of Dominican Republic. So it's it's probably made by some other distillery and then Old Line buys mm -hmm. it, I guess. Oh, so Which it's not, not a bad thing. No, 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 I don't think so at all. Now it's this got, one... It's got a nice, it does have a nice nose on it. Yes, yes. Nice caramel, vanilla. Yeah. Did you... Oh, before you drink. Did you drink already? Mm-hmm. So I read this white paper about drinking whiskey. Yeah. That said that we're drinking whiskey wrong. Okay. And even, like, these type of, like, glasses are wrong. These glasses aren't bad, though. Not bad, but, but they were... I forgot what shape they were talking about, but... They were talking about, we like to drink whiskey and kind of aerate it right, on our, in our palates. And they were saying in this white paper that by doing that and adding oxygen and aerating your, your, your beverage, you're actually creating a lot of volatile um, reactions that actually make it much more astringent. So they were saying that don't take any air sip without any air hold it in your mouth and across your palate to the count of 12 and then swallow and then evaluate okay well, let's try It's a little bit different. It, it's... The, the, I can see your face, yes. <laughs> well, well the, the, it's the 114 proof that it burns after a moment. Yeah, because... Okay, let's go to... 
drinking overproof spirits. Yes. Um, it's not proof down. Right, right. Right. So you you have a concentrated flavor. And that, for me, a small sip, letting it wash over my palate, and then go down, is the way I prefer to do it. You know, um, yeah, letting it hold in there, you get, you especially for over a high, uh, barrel proof or a high proof, you don't, you start to lose a little bit, a little bit of it, you start to get a little more of that biting. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, when you're drinking coffee, you're breathing into your nose, because how much your actually olfactory plays into your taste. There's a lot of olfactory. So normally for me, when I'm sipping, you know, I'll breathe into the cup and I'll breathe, you know, I'll I'll smell that and I'll try to bring that in as I take that small sip, and really let it just wash over my palate. Um, when I did that the first sip. I, I enjoyed that a little bit more okay. than doing that, but I did get some other flavors I didn't necessarily get before mm -hmm. in trying to let it just rest on my palate. But it's it quickly became a, a little bit more unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, I think with the lower strength, yeah, it would be it's much more enjoyable because, or maybe maybe it should be tailored that this cast strength over hundred proof. Maybe not 12 seconds, but maybe like six. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'll tell you, that first sip, when I just let it wash over, I wouldn't tell you that was 114. I would say it was closer to 90, maybe 85. I mean, it's... It's very smooth. It's very smooth. Very smooth. Especially for, you wouldn't know it. Yeah. Dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely get a lot of vanilla, mm -hmm. and that, that caramel, even a little bit of molasses -y, That that real classic kind of like rum. Yeah, but it's that vanilla and caramel are really strong with it. And it it has some, I don't know if you call it lacing, but as it drips down, it yeah. does do some good things in the glass. Oh. You know this this kind of rum, right? That I've I've long been a fan of the the Florida Cunha Seven. Yeah. Long been a fan. Partially because you know it's what we drink when we're at the at the farms and for coffee, and also at at the farms in Nestle for the cigars. Like everybody loves it. And but drinking something like this, and then you drink the Seven. Man, it's a whole different world. It's yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I remember one time, you know, I, I was, we were going down to the cabin and we are going hunting, which is more or less just a word of saying we're going to hang out. Uh, you know, if a deer comes by the picnic table, we might get a deer that year. But, um, it's a lot of right, but we, you know, every year it's a way for me to see an extended part of my family. And we do a toast. And those guys are, you know, old school guys that, you know, shot whiskey. Mm. And I made the mistake of bringing a sipping whiskey for the toast where everybody shot it. And it was it was good whiskey. It was uh, uh, John J. Bowman. Okay. And um, everybody shot down that 100 proof whiskey. And it was, it was neat. And uh, I think it might have almost killed somebody. <laughs> but they're like, well, what's, what is this? You know, and I'm like, you just got, you got, you got to sip it. You, you can't just shoot this. this. That's not what this is. Your people are crazy. So I learned a very important lesson in that case. Mm. You know, there's a big difference between shooting whiskey and uh, and sipping whiskey. Yes, yes, I agree, <laughs> agree. This is definitely on the sipping category. Absolutely. Finding a good, finding a good rum is, is not easy. No, no, it's not. I mean, but I think that's also partially because there's just not as much awareness of rum. Yeah. I mean, like rum is, 
Like, I, I prefer rum over whiskeys because I kind of like that sweetness. But I think it's just that most people are, most people in modern times have been gravitating towards whiskeys and bourbons and scotches. Now, even though we're down at the bottom, how does that rum pair differently with cigar than that coffee? It's nice. No, completely, completely, completely. The sweetness from this has actually completely overpowered any sweetness coming from this. Yes, agreed, agreed. But here's the thing, like with this cigar, I mean, it's we're like at the I, I'm we're at the very, I mean, which is testament to how how nice of a cigar this really is. Like some you wouldn't, you would never get this far. No. Now, because I've been talking. Mm -hmm. and taking my time I'm just now starting to get where I could use just a little bit of a touch up okay and be good but I might be able to work it through without doing that now that being said if you notice your cigars maybe not burning all the way around or you're starting to get you know a little canoeing is there anything you do differently to, to maybe correct that cigar well, if it, like like right now, it's starting. To, it, like if you look at it here, there, this is higher than here, so there is a little bit of unevenness, which is the first unevenness that I've had the entire yeah. time. I, at this stage, I wouldn't really do anything. Right. Pretty much, if I try to do anything, it'll burn my fingers. <laughs> but if it's if it's earlier in the cigar, I might try to like light on the other side to bring it evenly. But I don't know if that really works too well. See, I normally, I would normally try to get it without having to introduce more heat. Right. So I might actually almost try blowing through a little bit or making oh. or maybe making a series of very small little kind of puffs. To try to even that out. Right. To try to kind of give that little burst and kind of get that line walking back around to even things out. Oh that's good. I'll have to try that next time that happens. Because, I don't know if you can see, right now, oh, yeah. there's that little bit, but just making those small little puffs, and kind of doing it a little faster than I normally would, it started evening this thing back out, and bringing it back in back flat. In, okay. Just, just with that, it's gotten right back nice. where it's supposed to be. But I mean, it all comes down to the construction. If this wasn't made right, I couldn't do that. Yeah, agreed. You know? Agreed. Well, interesting with this cigar that you know, looking at the at the specifications for it, you know, like. Uh, I guess Saka has revealed, you know, of course it reveals that it's the the wrapper is an Ecuador Connecticut shade, what they call the G2BW. The binder is a Mexican Mata Matacapan, San Andres Negro de Temporal. And then lists the fillers. The fillers are what? One, two, three, four, four fillers. A Nicaraguan Candega SCG, CSG, Pueblo Nuevo Criollo, Hoya Esteli C98, and ASP Esteli Hybrid Ligero. Which is rather unusual, especially in modern times, with that a cigar manufacturer would disclose so much detail about their blend. Right. And the interesting part, it's most of those come from Nicaragua, right? Yeah, all the bind, all the fillers. Right. From the and this, when you compare it, this goes against everything you thought a Nicaraguan cigar could be. Yes, yes. Yeah, it doesn't have that pepperiness that, that people no. always expect. And, right. And that strength. That like really forceful strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I say that, but an exception is the uh, the binder because it's that uh, San Andreas. Bird, no, the, the right. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's yeah. right. So, but I mean, like even even if you think about like, it's made at the Hoya de Nicaragua factory, mm -hmm. and if you think of like cigars like the Hoya Red, which is a much more forceful cigar, you know, it really it really kind of shows the. The versatility of a factory. Yeah. That they can go from something like that or the other Hoyo lines that are much more forceful to something like this. Right. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. But it's, like you say, it's, I hadn't thought about that before, it being mostly Nicaraguan, but I mean, and it's so much different than everything else in his line. Yes. He, he sought out to make a different cigar. He absolutely made a different cigar. Um, uh, it's, it's worth giving a whirl and making your own opinions. Like, you know, I, I haven't really, I mean, I've smoked different cigars from his line, from Dumbart Dunbarton's line, but I don't really recall. Like, I, like, is this very different than the regular Sober Mesa? It's been a little while since I've smoked that okay. cigar. Most of the time, if I dip into his line, I'm going to the... Um, Mikarita? Mikarita, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's nice. That's I think that's a nice one. Yeah. Again, I don't... Like, again, it goes... For me, it goes back to the price point, like... Mm -hmm. But the Microdia, it really isn't that bad. It's if it's, it might be. I think it is over ten, but it's not that far over ten. So it's not that. It's not that much of a reach. You know. Yeah, yeah. I get, so I get it. I get it. For me, it, it's more. I want something a little bit different, because I, I think the top three brands that I normally go for, 100% go for Royal Craft first. I, I probably smoke more of that than abs I definitely smoke more than that than anything else. Um, but I'll also go into Warped. Oh, Warped's good, yeah, yeah. And then every once in a while, maybe Dumbarton. And Guardian of the Farm is really nice, too. Yeah, yeah, Guardian of the Farm. Even some of the other ones, um, like the Master of the Tempo. Mm. It's a solid cigar. Price point's not too crazy. And it's good. Um, the 19... I don't see too much of those in the market, though. Do... Yeah. It's not not always... You're right. It's not always there. But their 1984 uh, cigar uh, aficionado, I think, labeled that number three this year. Oh. For the 1984. And that one is a little bit more on the lighter side than what I normally would smoke. So for me, it's a great change of pace. Um, I think it's, a, it's, I believe, around a 50 ring gauge or so. So okay. it's not too crazy. Um, I gotta admit, one of the things that probably kept me from really trying this cigar is the fact that when he first released it, it only had larger format. Oh, okay. You okay. know, and I normally would not grab this cigar because it's at that 52, and that's on the top side of what I prefer. So, I mean, even if I have in my head that I'm gonna go to a shop, and let's say I'm looking for, um, the, uh, the uh, oh gosh, I'm looking for a certain cigar. If they don't have the size that I want, even though I really want that cigar, I'm probably going to buy something else. <clears throat> Sin Compromiso, that's what I was thinking of. Oh, that's, that's a good one. That's it's good. a great cigar, but... A lot of times you see a larger format. But those are those are on the like the eighteen dollar range. They are, yeah. yeah. And so when I, if I'm going to spend that, I want the size that I know I'm going to like. Understood. Understood. You know. All right, I'm going to have to stop because now it's burning my fingers. The wrapper is coming off. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Here's the binder. Oh God, actually, it is burning my finger now. All right. So, is the is the binder sweet? Can can I even it's hold it? Not, no, I don't I know. <laughs> this is going to end with a cigar in your lap. Okay, I'm I'm I put that down. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I I I'm a I'm about done for me too because I can feel the warmth in my fingers. It's I've been going slow. It's starting to tunnel just a little bit, a little bit more. And I don't think I've got enough here to try to bring it back. Yeah, I, I can. So, I can. I think um, with that, that's my last, last one. Nice. Oh, so tell me about this 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 uh, box you have here. So, 
I, I've had a couple Royal Craft boxes, right. and I wanted to make it an ashtray. So, fortunately, at cool. work, I, uh, we deal with metal fabrication um, machinery. Uh, mm -hmm. We're an importer for different brands, and I was able to kind of design a little t template, punch it out, and then insert in a metal liner to make it into an ashtray. And uh, that's actually really well done. So galvanized steel. Just yeah, galvanized steel. You know, I was there a reason for galvanized, or just what you had at the shop? It's 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 what we had available. Okay. And I also, if I put a good, oh, it's really tight in there. Yeah, yeah. I I made it a little bit too big and just uh, said it. This is going to fit. Oh, that's that's <laughs> nice. I mean, and it's in the the box has this cutout. Mm -hmm. That's that's part of the box. Original it's design, part of the right? box, so yeah. That's a natural like cigar rest. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's really well done. Yeah. And then the lid still fits on. It's a little bit higher, but yeah, it fits. <laughs> so if you want one of these made, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty awesome. And but the the but you can, but this I guess you can program to any box. I just have to get the dimensions and uh, go through a little bit of trial and error. But yeah, we're, I was able to punch out the shape and then took it over to our small electric press brake and then bent it. To now, make did you it fit? Did you have to like, like I noticed it's really loose the lid. The lid. Did you have to? Um, well, it's also really trim loose. the lid at all. I didn't touch the lid, but the reason why it's loose because it's so wedged in there is that. That inside that insert was so tight that it, I actually uh, did force it a little bit too much uh -huh. and put a little crack oh, yeah, inside a little crack, the box. There's a little crack right there, I think. which I I used some glue and said that I can fix. <laughs> awesome. So, but it, for the first time doing it, it didn't turn out too bad. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah, I can. I mean, there's there's room for improvement. Well, it's the first time, so that's good. Yeah. That's good. yeah. Plus, it was it was good exercise because uh, you know just working with the computer software, being able to um, identify the punch and lay out the shape. Um, some of it is uh, the math is. Uh, <laughs> I could have taken a little more time and and really done the math right mm -hmm. to be able to figure out once it bent how it would fit and that would fit perfectly. Um, but you know, I wasn't working with any kind of CAD software development. I just used... You just programmed it in the machine? I programmed it into the machine. I programmed oh, wow. it into the press brake. And the press brake will actually tell you and project in for you a, a length. And so I tried using that to figure out what my deduction would be to how, I, how, sm how much smaller I need to make that. Because if you think about a book, and when you fold a book you know, or, you, or a stack of paper, you have a, a portion of the paper that gets smaller, but on the back side, that paper is going to try to stretch, so you'll start to see that kind of like angle to it. The same thing happens with metal, hmm. and you always have more material that's going to end up stretching than it's going to be material that's compressing when you try to fold it. So you have to try to work that into your bend points to get it to fit exactly right. So there's, um, there's you don't think of metal that way, but it really does, it, it's different once you actually start forming it. You have to think of it differently. Mm. So, but it's cool. Yeah. That is cool. That is cool. I mean, yeah. so if you are in need of, so Al does uh, metalworking machinery. Is that what you yeah, call it? Yeah, like press brakes, shears, uh, CNC turret punches, um, even notchers and iron workers. Uh, are different machines that we we uh, we bring in, supply to manufacturers in the United States. Yeah, so if you do any kind of metal work and you need equipment, let me know. Talk to Al. Let me know. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. We actually worked with a customer that is making different uh, inserts for HVAC, for a human, um, kind of a, they're ultraviolet, so they, they clean the air. Mm -hmm. And it was taking them to make one part it was taking them roughly about seven minutes because they had different tool changes and they're just working with older press brakes and older technology. Um, 
we were able to come in there with our machine and within it now takes them a minute and a half two minutes wow that they can form the part with no tool changes and has really changed their production uh, so much so that they actually within four months purchased a whole nother, another machine to try you know because increase in production well I mean gosh if you took seven minutes down to two I mean that's oh yeah that's like a factor of three I know least. Oh, yeah, absolutely amazing. and they don't have any tool changes they're able to do it all within uh, the machine and, and setting up the tools within the machine so they don't have to take it, tear everything down put it in there just to make you know two different bends and then run their production they're able to go from flat sheet to full product without any tool change wow so it, it was a That's big awesome. difference it was a very big so difference. happy customers happy yeah very yeah. happy yeah they're cool they're they're a very cool customer awesome all right, so I guess that's good for today. It's yeah. already, gosh, we're, we're like over two hours into it. Um, so coming up next week on the 13th, we're going to be doing the Paul Gamerian, um 30th Anniversary Series 3. What is it? It's called the Paul Gamerian Gourmet Series 3 30th Anniversary Short Robusto. We're going to smoke that next week. So if you have the chance, um, grab one of those. You can, uh, I'm not sure... The distribution of Pulgarmir is not, not as wide as a lot of them, a lot of cigars. No, it's, 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 we get it in this area because he's based yeah, in Virginia. outside that Virginia, yeah, that Virginia area. So like uh, for, the, for next week's cigar, I got them at, at their boutique. So they've got a place called McLean Cigars in McLean, Virginia. And um, you can call down there and uh, Emil will ship to you wherever you are in the country. So grab one for next week. We'll be back on uh, Thursday the 11th at uh, 8 p.m. again. Um, Thanks for tuning in. Remember, if you'd like to get some coffee, go to SproCoffee.com and uh, be sure to use the Coffee Live discount code and you get 10% off your entire order. Um, I'll link that also and that's linked in the description below. Um, what else there to say? So, you know, if you like this, make sure you tune in next week. Uh, subscribe, like the video, and uh, don't forget to turn on your post notifications so that you'll be able to know what's happening. And then... We release uh, video. I release videos on this channel, the Ono Coffee Channel, every Saturday, and then we also do the Spro Coffee Channel, which is all coffee content, and that comes out every Monday and Wednesday. So we do that. Um, this past week we did uh, on Wednesday we did the uh, Troubleshooting Espresso. So it's always about coffee and and how to make better coffee. Um, anything you want to add or? No, no. I, that's that's great. Well, thanks for coming out. We appreciate hey, yeah, you having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you know being able to come out here and. You know, talk and kind of figure out what's up and up on that cigar. Well, right on, right on. All right, so until next week, have a great week. Nice to, nice to smoke with you. All right, good night.